Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for tuning in to another session of EI Live for the K-12 edition. Happy Earth Day, and uh, thank you for taking the time to join us today. This series of EI Live uh, for K-12 students and educators is brought to you by the Earth Institute at Columbia University. My name is Cassie, and I'll be moderating the event today, and I'm the director for the Office of Education and Outreach. I work with a lot of our students and uh, with our, I should say, with a lot of our scientists to bring their research into K-12 science education programs, both um, in and out of schools. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with the Earth Institute, we're a research organization within Columbia University that blends research in both the physical and social sciences, education and practical solutions to guide the process of sustainable development. Experts that make up the Earth Institute include earth scientists, economists, business and policy experts, specialists in public health and law, researchers, teachers, and students. The Institute itself is actually made up of more than two dozen research centers and several hundred people who work across many uh, departments and disciplines at Columbia. What we're hoping to do with these EI Live K-12 sessions is to introduce you to the interdisciplinary work through our experts. Over the next couple of months, we'll feature a variety of these sessions for students and educators, and we'll also be building on the EI Live series to include other content. Today, we have the great pleasure of hearing from Laurel Zayama from the Lamont Doherty Earth Observatory. She's going to be discussing the topic of microplastics with us today, and she'll help us understand why these teeny tiny plastics are showing up everywhere and why it should matter to us. We're going to have Laurel do her presentation and then open it up for questions towards the end of the, the, the talk. If you do have a question, please type it into the chat box just to the right of the video. We're going to be monitoring that chat box throughout and we'll make sure that we get to all of your questions. And if we don't, please do feel free to get in touch with me afterwards. We're also going to uh, have an opportunity for students participating uh, to write down some answers uh, towards a later part of the presentation. So that's what we'll also use the chat box for. If you're having any technical difficulties, please email me directly. So without further ado, here's Laurel. Hi, everyone. Happy Earth Day. Um, as Cassie said, my name is Laurel Thyma. I'm the Education Program Assistant at Lamont Doherty Earth Observatory of Columbia University. Um, my job is incredible because I get to work with scientists um, at Lamont, and I get to take their science and make it um, applicable and something that uh, students of all ages, teachers, and the public can learn about and then um, hopefully uh, encourage environmental stewardship so they can make changes in their own life to help our earth. So I um, work from anything from Hudson River related uh, curriculum to polar education with a focus on climate change um, and sustainability education as well. So I kind of dabble in a, a lot of different areas, but a place that has um, a subject that has a special place in my heart is microplastics. So over the past year or so, I've been working on um, studying and trying to understand this tiny form of pollution. And I'm going to be talking about that today. So as Cassie said, um, the beauty of science is the art of asking questions. So please feel free to ask any questions in the chat box and I'll do my best to answer them. Um, but I wanna start by a little interactive um, session. So feel free to answer anything in the chat box right now. But I'm gonna show you some objects right behind me. And I want you guys to tell me what objects on this table you think contain microplastics. So I'll kind of walk you through them. The first one right here is just a glass of tap water. Do you guys think there's microplastics in there? Then we have a bottled water. So unopened bottle of water. We have toothpaste and we have face wash. We also have laundry detergent. And the last item on the table are like stretchy yoga pants. Okay, go ahead, fill in the chat box what you think contains microplastics. You can say all, you can say none, you can pick certain items. 
um, go ahead and do that now and I'll see, um, I'll have Cassie kind of report back to see what people think. Okay, so just in case you need a recap because um, these items are a little far away, the things on the table, I want you guys to tell me whether you think they have microplastics in them. So the first object is a glass of tap water. Do you think there are microplastics in there? The next item is a bottle of water, unopened bottle of water. The next is toothpaste. So your standard toothpaste. The next item we have is face wash. It's in a very small container, but face wash. We also have laundry detergent. Do you think there's microplastics in your laundry detergent? And the last item, are yoga pants, stretchy yoga pants. Do you think there are microplastics in here? Go ahead and <laughs> put in your answers, great. Okay, great, Laurel. Um, we have a variety of answers. Majority of them actually say all of the products have microplastics in them. Um, some uh, singled out the water bottle, especially, uh, and the yoga pants. <laughs> so. <laughs> but um, most of the answers say that all of those things that you showed us have microplastics in them. Okay, very good. So if you said all of them, you are almost correct. But this is actually a good thing. Um, these personal care products used to contain microplastics. Um, and the reason for that was, is they thought that these microbes were a great exfoliant. So for face wash, it's going to peel off that dead skin on your face. For your uh, toothpaste, it's going to be really abrasive and clean off all the plaque on your teeth. Um, however, the uh, in the U.S., the Microbead Free Water Act of 2015 phased out microbeads in rinse off personal care products by July 2017. So that's actually amazing. We do not um, have microplastic beads put into these products anymore, which is wonderful. Um, so for example, this little St. Ives bottle, instead they are advertising that they're using walnut shells as an exfoliant. And um, this toothpaste doesn't have any abrasive uh, micro beads in them at all. So that's really great. That's a great step in moving forward. Um, if you said yes to tap water and bottled water, you are correct. So I think there is a huge mis misconception here that people think that if they're buying bottled water, that they're buying the cleanest um, water, that it's actually safer to drink. That's actually the opposite. So if you are buying bottled water, there are more microplastics in your bottled water than any water that's coming out of your tap. So I would highly encourage people to move away from bottled water. Not only are you consuming more microplastics, but you're adding to the problem because this is a single use plastic that's going to be put in the trash or recycle bin. Um, so instead, I would suggest just drinking your tap water, using a filter um, or like a Brita filter, anything that can kind of filter out and try and catch any of those microplastics um, would be great. But you're correct. There are microplastics in both of these. And to many people's surprise, uh, maybe not to you guys, but to a lot of people's surprise, there are actually microplastics in your laundry detergent. And unfortunately, the Microbead Free Water Act does not cover anything for industrial use or any detergents, which means that they're still allowed, companies are still allowed to sell detergent with microplastics in them. And it's kind of the same concept is that they think that it's gonna increase friction, um, which will then try and clean your clothes better by having these little bits of plastic in them. So when you do go shopping, um, be really aware and um, try and purchase laundry detergent that doesn't have any plastic in them. There is a trick though, oftentimes these companies they don't have to put their ingredients on the bottle. So you have to do a little bit of research and digging before and look on their website to see what they make their products out of. Um, but if you see anything like um, polyethylene or anything that is a plastic polymer, I would choose to move away from that uh, type of detergent because these detergents, they wash our clothes, they get drained out of our washing machine, they go to the wastewater treatment plant, but the wastewater treatment plant doesn't have filtration small enough to be able to catch these microbeads um, before they enter our waterways. So really important, we don't wanna be adding to the problem. And lastly, I heard a lot of people say yes on the yoga pants, you are correct. Um, nylon spandex, I mean, this is a synthetic 
um, fiber that is created um, to make these type of clothes. So um, we're going to talk about some ways on if you do own these, um, that's fine. Just th there are going to be some cleaning methods that you can use to try and catch um, these microplastics before they re-enter the waterways. Okay. Thank you for uh, participating in that. So now I think um, I think that there is a huge plastic problem, but the scale is a little bit hard to fully grasp. So I'm going to use a comparison. There are 400 billion stars in the Milky Way galaxy, tons of stars. However, there are 5.25 trillion pieces of plastic in our ocean surface or on our ocean surface, which is 13 times more pieces of plastic in our ocean than stars in our galaxy, which is pretty astonishing. Um, and the paper that came out with this, this really large number of 5.25 um, trillion pieces is actually just looking at the plastic that was on the surface of the ocean. So it's not even considering the plastic that um, could be underneath the surface, that could be in the water column or even in the sediments below on the ocean floor. Um, now this approximately equals to two, um, 268,940 tons of microplastics that are in our oceans um, due to maybe watershed outflows or just population density and litter and um, maybe like maritime activities like fishing and nets being um, lost at sea. So this is a huge problem and it's not just in our oceans. It's found its way in all areas of our earth. Okay, so the origin of plastics, like where did these come from? So the first man-made plastic was made in the, the mid-1800s by a man named Alexander Parks. And after the creation of plastic, it really went, the technology really went dormant until World War II. And then during that time period, they found that this plastic could be great for war machinery, such as like piping around wires. So the plastic production and the technology started to ramp up. Um, but then after the war, um, the oil industry, because plastic is made out of petrochemicals and oil, the oil industry needed to find different ways for them to continue making this profitable business. So they started to push plastic um, to be used for single use purposes, like what we see today. So cutlery, straws, uh, plates, and that started this huge boom in the 50s called this throwaway living lifestyle. Um, people thought it was a luxury to be able to have plastic, um, not have to clean up, not have to do dishes, and just throw it all away at the end. Um, however, they made a huge error. This was a huge design flaw to use plastic as a single-use product, and we're going to talk about why in a little bit. Um, but these plastics, because they're so easy to make, they're inexpensive, they're resistant to water, chemicals, temperature, they found a ton of uses for plastic. So the production of plastic, plastic just started to ramp up. And so if you're looking at this graph, this figure one on the left-hand side, you're looking at on the Y column, the total production of virgin plastic by a year on the X um, axis, sorry, X axis. And so if you are seeing um, the ramp up, it's exponential by, um, or since 2000, the world has produced as much plastic as all the years preceding combined. So that means half of the plastic that uh, was produced from 2000 to 2016, that's half of the plastic that was created in the entire um, existence of plastic. So that is a lot. And you just see that our reliance on plastic has uh, increased. And so while plastic is made out of these petrochemicals or oil, um, not all plastic polymers are made the same. So you guys can see on the left-hand picture here, there are tons of different plastic polymers and each one is used for a different purpose. But some of the ones that you're probably gonna be most familiar with are on that top line. So if we're looking from the far left, polyethylene, that is the common polymer in plastic bags. We have polypropylene, which are in bottle caps, ropes, um, polystyrene, which a common name for that is styrofoam. So that's very common in takeout um, containers, cutlery, uh, coolers, floats. Then we have um, nylon, which is very typical in synthetic clothing, 
rope fishing nets, and then polyester, which is another type of like synthetic textile uh, used, used for textiles. And then if you look on the picture on the right, you can see that those top five types of plastic, the ones that we're probably most common with or most familiar with, are the types of polymers that are most commonly found in marine microplastic debris. So with polyethylene being definitely the most. Um, there are other types of plastic polymers, but not to the scale as the other five. And due to the chemical structure of plastics, they don't naturally biodegrade. And therefore all plastic ever created still exists. So if you think about it, we have these decomposers and bacteria that have learned over millions of years how to break down organic matter. Um, but plastic is relatively new and they have really strong carbon-carbon bonds that make it very difficult, near impossible to biodegrade in nature. Um, and so there are some biotic or abiotic processes that are not biodegrading naturally, but breaking up these plastics into smaller and smaller pieces. And that's where we see um, the form of microplastics and even nanoplastics, which are even smaller. And so these microplastics, it's this new form of pollution. And because they're so small, they have become pervasive in all uh, reaches of our earth. And they can cause um, a huge danger to global ecosystems. So what are microplastics really? Well, since it's a new field, scientists haven't really um, come to a consensus on the size range, but something that's most commonly stated is that it's anything from one micron, which is roughly the thickness of a blood cell, to five millimeters, which is the edge of a pencil eraser. And if you're thinking the word micro, microscopic, Five millimeters isn't really microscopic, but um, for the sense of this terminology, this was the most accepted size range. Um, and then if you're thinking nanoplastics, which are even smaller, we have anything from one micron to one um, nanometer, which is very tiny. And not all microplastics are made the same either. So we have primary and secondary microplastics. Primary microplastics, they were manufactured to be small. So that's gonna be your microbeads, your nurdles, and your microfibers that are gonna be in synthetic textiles. Secondary microplastics, um, they are formed from the degradation of a macroplastic. So that can happen from physical force. So if you're thinking that there is um, like a plastic bag in the ocean and waves are crashing and breaking up this into tiny, tiny bits, that would be physical fragmentation. We also have um, oxidation, Bacteria can break up these micro these plastics into micro bits, and then photodegradation from the sun, which could be UV or um, thermal de degradation as well. And so we oftentimes see this as fragments, films, or foam. So diving a little bit deeper into these, if you were to try and find these microplastics in the natural environment, a micro bead is like perfectly cylindrical or uh, spherical, and you're gonna see that they can range in a different uh, colors, but mostly they're gonna be blues or whites. Then we have nurdles. Now, if you've never heard of a nurdle before, um, it's a virgin plastic that's created and shipped around the world to companies to mold and create into a uh, different plastic product. So this is virgin plastic. And oftentimes it gets, it gets uh, lost in transit. So if there is a ship that's carrying these nurdles, and it spills over, then you might be able to find these nurdles on the incoming beach as it washes on shore. And then we have microfibers. So these are synthetic fibers. They're created um, to be used in synthetic textiles. So just like my yoga pants that we talked about. Now, secondary microplastics, um, the first type is a fragment. So fragments can be all different shapes, typically irregu <clears throat> irregular and they may have a, a waxy exterior texture. So if you are trying to identify different plastics, um, these guys are pretty easy to pick out and very common. We also have microfoam. So anything that's styrofoam, you guys have seen styrofoam before. It breaks up really easily if you're not careful. And so those tiny little foam bits can enter um, our natural system and cause a lot of problems as well. And then microfilms. 
is the last type of secondary microplastic. And so this typically comes from the breakup of a plastic bag, but also anything like saran wrap that can be really easily degraded. Now, microplastics, they come from a variety of sources. Um, some of the top sources found by the International Union for Conservation of Nature found that synthetic textiles is the leader in microplastic pollution that enters the ocean. And so that can be from if you wash your synthetic clothes in the washing machine, it's um, going to shed some of those microfibers. Then when the water drains, goes to the wastewater treatment plant like we talked about, and those wastewater treatment plants don't have filtration that can catch those fibers before it enters our natural system. Um, and even in the dryer, <clears throat> the dryer also is going to be shedding a lot of those fibers and um, it can be emitting them right into the air. So synthetic textiles is a huge contributor. Another one are car tires. So the wear and tear of a car tire just driving on the roads. <clears throat> on the roads, um, city dust, which can be a combination of a variety of things, car tires, um, breaking up of road markings, synthetic textile fibers as well. Um, a variety of things can contribute towards city dust. Road markings, um, as we talked about, marine coating has an epoxy, that's a, a plastic substance on the outside of boats. Personal care products, even though we're not producing them um, in the US, other countries still are. And then plastic pellets or nurdles. So if you're looking at these statistics and you can do math pretty quickly, you're seeing that about two thirds of all of these microplastics in the ocean come from the combination of synthetic textiles and car tires. So if those are the big drivers, then we have to start thinking about innovative ways of how we can um, move away from those so we don't contribute these toward uh, the microplastic pollution issue. And for all the properties of plastic that make them so valuable, it also makes them extremely easy to transport um, by the air and the sea and in the ground. So plastic, uh, microplastics, they're very small in size. They have very low density. Um, so in the ocean, most types of plastic can float and they have a stubborn environmental persistence as we talked about. So that means that these plastics have been able to be transported all over the world. I mean, scientists are finding them in new places all the time. There has been evidence of microplastics in Mariana's Trench. There are evidence of microplastics in the Arctic, in the Antarctic, which are some of the most remote places in the world. So these plastics, they can be transported by a variety of ways. They can be transported by ocean circulation. So once they enter that waterway, they are subject to the ocean's movements. Um, they can also be atmospherically deposited. So they can be carried by wind or rain or snow. And that's something that we're trying to look at right now. Um, we also see a lot of bio um, magnification in the food web. So if a small organism eats it, another organism eats that organism, now they have microplastics in their bodies. And so you can see how it kind of builds up in the food chain that way. Um, and so we're, there's still a lot to learn about microplastic transport and how it's moving throughout the world. So that's something that we're really trying to focus on at Le Mans. All right, so these microplastics are everywhere. What are the impacts? So there is still a lot of research that needs to be done to fully understand how microplastics are impacting us, but it's not looking great so far. <laughs> so since these microplastics can be carried um, through waterways, the ocean, groundwater, aquifers, soil, air, et cetera, it has the ability to pollute terrestrial and aquatic organisms. And so if these organisms are ingesting these plastics, a couple of things can happen. Um, one, it can cause blockages in their stomach because they won't be able to pass these plastics through their bodies. Um, or organisms think they're full when they're actually not because they're eating plastic. Um, and then some other pl um, plastics are really sharp. So if they're ingested, they can cause lacerations in the bodies of these organisms. Uh, and they can also biomagnify up the food chain. And that's an activity that we're gonna talk about at the very end. <clears throat> Plastics also contain a variety of additives, such as um, flame retardants, biocides, plasticizers, lubricants, all these things are uh, dangerous if an animal was to consume and then those chemicals were to be released. Um, and plastics also just by nature have the ability to absorb other chemicals like um, hydrophobic organic contaminants or HOCs, uh, persistent organic pollutants or POPs, 
uh, polychlorinated biphenyls, PCBs, and heavy metals. So if all of those things can be absorbed in a plastic, and then that plastic is eaten by an organism, those chemicals can leach into that organism. And some recent studies have found that these chemicals can cause a variety of negative impacts, like inhibition of growth, developmental defects, lowered reproduction rates, um, et cetera, depending on the animal and how much they've eaten. So this is a huge issue. And we haven't even talked about nanoplastics. So nanoplastics, even smaller, have the ability to um, permeate lipid membrane. So they can actually enter our blood uh, bloodstream. So there still needs to be a lot of work done on that to see those impacts. Um, and so impacts on humans, we are not entirely sure, but they are hypothesizing that it'd be very similar to some of the animals that we're observing. So how much microplastic do you think a human might ingest just from eating or drinking water? I'll let you guys take a couple seconds to guess. The answer might surprise you. So we, some people could ingest up to five grams of microplastic a week. That is the weight of your credit card. So think about eating your credit card every week worth of plastic. Um, it is shocking. And some of the products that we are consuming that have microplastics in them include our drinking water, like we talked about, um, shellfish or fish, beer, even beer, and salt. And those are just a handful of um, uh, like things that we might consume that have plastics in them. Um, now at Lamont, I was telling you that we are really interested in looking at microplastic transport. And so one thing that hasn't been widely studied is how snow might collect or transport microplastics. So we had some partners out in Aspen that were able to collect some snow for us, send it to our lab, and we processed it to see if there were microplastics in them at all, if so, what kind and how many. The results are pretty staggering. Um, we were given a two liter um, mason jar of water that was melted from snow. And we sampled just a subset of it. I think it was 10 milliliters. We found hundreds of microplastics just in that subset. And we found all types. So right here, you guys can see, you can see my mouse. This is a microfiber. The reason why it's fluorescing like that is because we used a method called now red staining. So we go through a process of um, filtering all of the snow melt and then staining it and then using a fluorescent light to have it shine. And um, this is what kind of showed up. So this is a microfiber. This is an image of all these little fluorescing orange bits. Those are all micro fragments. So those are broken up bits of plastic. We also have microfilm. So this, um, kind of looks like a broken up piece of, of, of a bag. And um, it kind of shines green because it shows that it's made of a different type of plastic polymer. So unfortunately, we found all these things in the plastic. That's only one sample. We really want to look at more to have a better understanding about um, snow in different areas of the world and how they may be contaminated with microplastics. So there's no question that there's an issue here, that we have this new form of plastic that can't always be seen by the naked eye. So what can we do? First, I'm calling you all to action on this beautiful Earth Day to stop using single-use plastic and stop releasing it into the environment. So that means um, refuse to use things like plastic water bottles or straws when you go to the store. Or if you're getting takeout, make sure you tell them that we don't need any plastic cutlery because you have metal cutlery at your house. Things like this are great ways just to reduce your intake of these single-use plastics that are eventually gonna be wasted anyway. When it comes to things like synthetics, um, synthetic clothes, the ways that you can try and catch them before they enter the um, water stream, wastewater treatment plant, um, you can use a filter in your washing machine to catch these plastics before they enter that way. And I suggest trying to air dry your clothes as opposed to using your dryer whenever possible. Um, your dryer actually wears and tears pretty hard on your clothes anyway. So if you were to air dry, you have a longer life of your um, clothing as well, which is great. It's a win-win. Um, and then of course, try and support sustainable businesses that are making a conscious effort to create products without plastic because 
oftentimes these businesses are small and they just need any support that they get. Um, they, the easy route is to use plastic because it is less expensive, but the sustainable long-term beneficial route is to um, use more natural products. All right, and so another thing that we can do, and this is great to build a community effort as well, is to get your friends and family together, um, once it's safe, of course, to go out and do beach cleanups or city cleanups or even community cleanups. If you think about how these microplastics and how these plastics can be moved all throughout the world, even if you don't live close to the ocean or close to a water body, these plastics can find their way and move to the lowest point, which is always the ocean. So to have these important um, community efforts is, is amazing. Um, and of course, we wanna encourage young people and encourage scientists and engineers to continually make new removal methods. These plastics are really hard to get out of the environment, but um, there's a lot of creative minds out there. And so if we encourage that um, knowledge, especially at a young age, then we're gonna be hopefully creating the next generation of scientists and engineers that can find solutions to these problems. And last but not least, educate your friends and family. So that's why I love my job. I love being able to teach people about these things so we can hopefully all work together as environmental stewards. I hear all the time that people think, I'm just one person, I'm not gonna make a difference. But that's not true because if you tell your friends and family and they get on board and then they tell their friends, you are creating now like an army of positive environmental influence um, and together we can all make a big difference. So some things that I have here that you guys hopefully can be inspired to do as well. Um, whenever you go to the grocery store, and if you live in New York, we just passed a um, no plastic bag ban, which is great. It's a great first step. Um, but if you need a reusable bag, you can get one. Um, the DEC was selling them for pretty, or giving them away for cheap. We can also get them in it pretty inexpensively. Bring these to the grocery stores with you. Um, this one actually fits up into a nice little ball. So you can just throw it in your purse. You don't even have to think about it. So I'll show you. Once it's all balled up, it takes up almost no space at all. And then it pops out into a bag. So it's a great way um, to reduce your intake of plastic bags. Um, you can bring around a metal straw with you. If you need to use straws or you like to use straws, um, that's great. Just I would choose metal or bamboo as opposed to plastic. It's also a great conversation starter if you're out at a restaurant. <laughs> um, and I always bring around my bamboo cutlery set. Um, so instead of using any plastic materials that they give me, I can use this as well. Um, and if you want to take it to the next level, um, I oftentimes just look around my house, look at all the things that are plastic and try to think of ways or sustainable alternatives to those plastic options. So one of the things I saw were razor heads. All this plastic is being disposed of. So instead I got an old fashioned safety razor for those of you who are shaving. Um, it's made of metal, it's really great, um, and it's really easy to use. So that's one way that I have helped as well. And then whenever you can, um, using bar soaps, bar shampoos, bar conditioners, anything that doesn't use any plastic is great. So we are definitely stocked up on those um, bars of soap as well. So those are just a few examples. I hope I'm kind of inspiring you guys to also take action. Okay, so now we're moving on to our lesson. So we have talked to a bunch of our teacher colleagues and friends, and something that they've said is that, um, well, of course we want our students to have a really strong understanding of microplastic pollution, so then they can be the solution in the future. Um, but during this really challenging time period, virtual learning has been um, shortened into 30 minute sections. So to engage a young person through the internet or through your computer, um, they say that different types of media are super helpful, short videos followed by an activity um, to really help them understand the key concept. So this lesson is really geared toward um, an age range of third through fifth. If you're a teacher, we're gonna have all these materials sent out to you with the recording. So don't worry about trying to find it now. We're happy to share that with you. And if you're a parent and you have a student um, that would like to join in, now is the time we're gonna um, talk about some of the key things that I said earlier, but in a really easy to understand fun way. So first I'm going to share this little video with you guys. Um, it's really quick, four minutes long, a lot of stuff we already talked about, but in a fun cartoon interactive way. 
So I'm gonna play that and enjoy. Microplastics? Okay, plastic. We all know what that is. It's in packaging, shopping bags, to-go cups, toys, car parts, synthetic clothing, electrical and home appliances, and plastic bottles. Plastic is an artificially made material, which is why it's technically called a synthetic compound. It's made mostly of crude oil, natural gas, or coal. It's not naturally biodegradable, unlike, for example, compost. That means plastic does not rot and often ends up as trash on the ground and in the ocean. There, the plastic parts disintegrate by heat, wind, and waves bit by bit into even smaller parts, known as microplastics. By definition, these tiny synthetic compounds are between five millimeters and one micrometer long. Even smaller particles are technically called nanoplastics. These shredded plastic waste particles are known as secondary microplastics. The wearing down of car tires, for example, is one of the biggest causes of microplastics. But before this trash is ever produced, the products must first be made. For that, you need primary microplastics. These are small plastic pellets. In industry, they serve as the basic material for every plastic product you can imagine. And plastics are used in various cosmetic products and household products as granules or in liquid form. The problem with microplastics. Like large plastic parts, they are not naturally biodegradable. And in cleaning processes in factories, but also in showering or washing clothes, they get into the sewer water. On land and in our water bodies, the crushed particles are moved by wind and waves. Rain carries the plastic into the sewage system. The smaller the particles, the harder it is to filter them. For example, in sewage treatment plants, millions of tons of microplastics are distributed everywhere, and that's increasing. The surface of microplastics is a <laughs> magnet for toxins and pathogens. Animals, both in the water and on land, confuse the plastic particles with small animals and consume them as food. Through the food chain, the pollutant-rich plastic particles finally reach our plates and make their way into our bodies. Even in our drinking water and our foods, such as salt, honey, or milk, you can find certain microplastics. The consequences of consuming plastic for animals are diverse. Internal injuries and inflammations, hormonal imbalances, illnesses, and even death. The effects on humans have not been researched enough yet. The topic of microplastics is often a hot debate. It's about rethinking and finding alternatives to plastic and about recycling so that the amount of plastic and the resulting microplastics found in nature no longer increases. Everyone can do their part. There are many possibilities. One thing is to stop using plastic altogether. Instead of to-go cups, you can use mugs or a thermos. Plastic bags can be replaced by bags brought from home, and the proper disposal of plastic waste is important, so it can be recycled and microplastics don't end up in nature. Okay. So a lot of stuff we already covered, but for those um, younger students that are just tuning in, I hope that was a great snapshot of what a microplastic is and how it impacts all of us. So this activity, this activity um, is something that we can send to you, all teachers or parents who wanna do it at home with their students. But it's a great way to introduce scale and a very simple model with inputs and outputs um, by using a STEAM approach. So STEAM stands for science, technology, engineering, arts, and math. And so what your student is going to do is just from that video, I would love them to draw microplastics. It could be anything. It could be micro beads. It could be micro fragments. It could be microfilms or fibers. It could be any color or shape 
Um, but one thing they do have to focus on is making sure it fits the scale. So remember, a microplastic is anything less <clears throat> than five millimeters. So they just have to really pay attention to that, having them um, gain an understanding of that scale concept. Um, after they've done that, they're going to try and think about the inputs of microplastics. So where did these microplastics come from? If it's a microbead, you could talk about how historically face wash used to have microbeads in them. If it was a microfilm, you could talk about how it could have come from a, a plastic bag. So they can draw these right here of what creates these microplastics, whether it be primary or secondary. Then they're going to talk about the outputs. Who is impacted by these microplastics? And it's going to be left up to them. They could talk about um, an ocean food web and how it builds up that ocean food chain. They could talk about humans and how humans could be impacted by microplastics. Then <clears throat> at the end, um, each student can choose one microplastic and explain its path through this model. So where did it start from, what it is now, and who is it impacting? And then they, the students can learn from each other as they share each one of these uh, pathways of microplastics. So it's just a very easy foundational way for them to have a really good understanding of microplastics um, by using an artistic approach. And then talking about the impacts, I'm gonna use this really simple marine um, food pyramid. And so at the bottom, we have our primary producers. So we have phytoplankton, seagrass, and algae. The next, the first order consumers are herbivores. We have zooplankton, which are small organisms, animal-like organisms, uh, blue tang, and a queen conch. The intermediate are mesopredators. We have a bar jack, a black grouper, a yellowtail snapper. And then our top apex predators are gonna be a gray reef shark and a bluefin tuna. So we wanna see, um, first, have your students look at all of this, um, all the animals that comprise of this uh, food pyramid. And then I want them to look and see what the microplastics that they just drew, what those really look like in this food pyramid. So some people might say that microplastics look a lot like the phytoplankton. So if we're looking at this food pyramid, what would happen if we replaced all the phytoplankton in this pyramid with microplastics? How is it going to impact each level, each trophic level, and eventually the apex predators? So let's find out. So first we're gonna start with zooplankton. Um, zooplankton are very small. In, so I'm gonna keep this in very easy math terms. So in this first order consumers, they're kind of smaller animals. They're only gonna eat two things a day. So zooplankton are only gonna eat two microplastics in one day. So now their microplastic count is two. The blue tang, let's say they eat a couple different things. So they eat microplastics and they eat seagrass. So they only have one microplastic in their body. The queen conch, maybe they ate a microplastic and algae. So how is this gonna impact the next trophic level, those mesopredators? Let's start with the bar jack. Now these animals are a little bit bigger. So instead of eating two meals a day, they're gonna eat three meals a day. So this bar jack is gonna eat two zooplankton and one queen conch. Now if we're doing some easy math here, that's two, four, five microplastics now in the bar jack. Even though they have not directly consumed microplastics themselves, they have eaten animals that have eaten microplastics, so now it's accumulating in their bodies. Let's look at the black grouper. Now, these animals are pretty big. They need to eat um, a fish of sustenance to uh, provide energy for their bodies. So let's say the black grouper eats three blue tang. They have three microplastics now in their body. One, two, three. And then the yellowtail snapper, they're a little bit smaller fish. So let's say that they eat all three of their meals or zooplankton. So some easy math here, we have two, four, six. They now have six microplastics in their body. What about these apex predators? So a shark is a really big predator. They need four meals in their day. So they eat one bar jack, two grouper because they need a lot of energy. So grouper are pretty big. They're gonna take on two grouper and then one yellowtail snapper. That math, um, adds up to 17 pieces of microplastic without that shark actually ingesting any microplastic directly, just through the food chain. This bluefin tuna, um, they are going to eat two bar jack and two yellowtail snapper, and that adds up to 22 pieces of microplastic. So as you guys can see, 
as you go up the food chain from the primary producers all the way up to the apex predators, these plastic just accumulate and grow um, all the way up the food chain. This is called biomagnification. biomagnification. So it means that the microplastics are biomagnifying up the food chain. So the apex predators are always going to have the most. Um, and this doesn't just um, relate to microplastics. This relates to um, a lot of other contaminants like mercury. And that's why people say that you need to be careful about eat, where you eat on the food chain and that whenever possible, don't eat at the top of the food chain because they accumulate the most toxins versus um, it's healthier for you and typically health, healthier for the environment to eat lower on the food chain. So to eat those primary producers or to eat those herbivores. Okay, so th that is the last activity. Um, I hope this was helpful and I'm happy to take any questions now. Thanks, Laurel. So we have some questions going back to sort of the, I'll start at the beginning so that these are uh, uh, answered in the order they were asked. Um, there was a question about whether or not there are microplastics in well water. Oh, that's really, that's a really interesting question. Um, I would say yes. So well water, um, microplastics are in groundwater as well. So while I haven't actually sampled any well water, I would presume that there would be microplastics in there as well. Great, thank you. And this question, I think came after you showed us the water bottle, the clear plastic water bottle with the water in it that was unopened. Do you think there would be less microplastics in a metal bottle than a plastic one? Um, so I'll show you my water bottle here. If you are filling up your metal water bottle from uh, the tap, then it will have less, less plastics in it because it's from that tap water. Um, the reason why the water bottle has more microplastics in it is because they don't have to go through the same um, rules and regulations and filtration regulations that filtered water from your tap does. And so it doesn't always catch those microplastics. So that's the key difference. Um, I'm not familiar with any company that sells bottled metal water, um, but that would be interesting to look into. But yeah, it's not necessarily about the, the water bottle leaching the plastics in, it's about the process of how it was collected. Great. Yeah, I think I, I think the person was probably after, um, you know, is it better to have um, our own metal bottles that we carry around rather than buying plastic water bottles so that there's fewer plastics in the in the water that that we're drinking? Yeah. Ah, uh, yes. Then definitely yes. <laughs> Yeah, great. Um, and in terms of, you know, you might have uh, hit on this, and sorry if this question is uh, repeating something that you've covered, um, but for human beings, how do microplastics affect us? And, and uh, so far, what is what is the research said about human beings specifically? Yeah, that's a really great question. And I'm sorry, we just, there isn't a lot of research on it. We just don't know. Um, there's not, even if there is, um, I haven't read very many studies, but even if there is one study, it's hard to make any hard conclusive statements um, without a large backup of literature. Um, I think the hypothesis are that how it's impacting the animals that consume, such as like developmental um, issues and, and challenges with repro uh, reproduction, I think those might be applicable to some of the impacts that might be that it might be having on humans. Great, thanks. And the next question is about the, I think that image you showed us at the very beginning where the ocean uh, surface was covered with plastics. Um, what percentage of that do you think comes from plastic water bottles and plastic bags? You know, are there more of plastic water bottles and plastic bags and other plastic products um, in our oceans? Um, great question. The hard number, I don't know. But if you can think back to that slide I showed you about the different plastic polymers, on the right-hand side, it was looking at um, the amount of, pla of the plastic polymer, polymer that is in our ocean, um, polypropylene and poly, uh, 
poly the one of me out plastic bag which is slipping my mind right now the plastic bags and water bottles that palmer is comprised of the most um so my guess would be that it is a huge chunk of the types of plastic that are found in our ocean Great, thanks. Um, the next question is about if, whether or not we know what the smallest organism is that has eaten or consumed plastics or microplastics. Do we know? Oh, yeah, so there were, um, there's a study that came out that was looking at um, zooplankton in the ocean. And I think it was just over 70% of the zooplankton that they sampled, of all the zooplankton that they sampled, 70% had plastic inside their little bellies. So from the literature I've read, that is some of the smallest um, organism that's eaten plastic. Um, however, I know that there is more research looking into what has consumed nanoplastics. And um, there is a hypothesis that even um, plants might be able to absorb those nanoplastics at, through its roots in the ground, because if those plastics are in, in the ground or in the groundwater, it can be um, uptaken by plants. But I think there still needs to be more literature on that. Thank you. Um, and I think this next question is related to um, the amount of microplastics that we may have ingested. And thinking back to the your credit card example, if we ate a plastic credit card every day, um, <laughs> How many micro, or do you happen to know, can we quantify how many microplastics are in um, a bottle of plastic water? If we were to drink that, like that bottle of plastic, uh, the, the plastic water bottle that you showed us with the water in it, um, could you estimate how many microplastics are in that bottle? Um, I don't know that number off the top of my head, but I know that there's a paper um, that was done, I think in 2019, that was looking specifically at um, tap water and bottled water, and it had some hard numbers of the water bottles that they sampled. Um, and it was, again, more than the tap water. I would have to get back with you on those hard numbers. Okay, not a problem. And for, for our viewers, if you do have additional questions after the session is over, uh, feel free to email me at the same email that you would have gotten this link from. Um, the last question that I have um, is about how we can have uh, students evaluate microplastics in snow melt. Um, how can they, and, and perhaps for other, in other situations too, how can students actually um, sample for, for microplastics in the things that they see around them every day? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, we have a project, as um, Cassie just mentioned, looking at uh, plastics in snow. It's called Plastic Snow. You guys can check it out online. Um, this next winter, if you have the ability to just collect the top um, five centimeters of the snowfall, put it into a glass jar. Um, we would love to accept those samples and we can process them in our lab and get back to you with how many plastics um, are in them. That would be a great way to contribute towards science and to find out what plastic is in your own backyard. Um, if you would like to, if you're near a water body and you'd like to look at plastics yourselves, you can look at some of those larger, more towards the five millimeter range scale of microplastics by creating your own type of trawling net. So a trawling net <clears throat> is like a giant net that you skims the surface of the water. So remember I said that plastic has a really um, low density. So a lot of different types of plastics float at the surface. If you create your own trawl, which you can typically do out of pantyhose, um, and you can scoop the surface, skim the surface, you can then observe and count and um, identify the different types of microplastics that you see. Um, again, this is something that you can do at home. It wouldn't be to the now red scale of those images that I showed you. That's something that needs to be done in the lab. And if you're thinking, hey, pantyhose are made of synthetic fibers, you're absolutely right. but that's not the type of microplastic that you'd be observing. You'd be observing some of those larger pieces. So um, I encourage you guys to go ahead, try that at home. It's a great way for you guys to be scientists in your own backyard. That's great. I think that's a great place to end. Um, Laurel, is there anything else you want to add to the to the group? Um, any other message or messages or takeaways? Um, I just want to say happy Earth Day and um, talking about pollution can be um, 
<clears throat> sometimes overwhelming, especially if you've never heard of microplastics before. But I just want to reiterate that there is power in numbers and that your individual action does have a big difference when it's contributing toward a larger group. So really make a pledge to yourself um, to stop using one form of single use plastic. Once you have a handle on that, I encourage you to choose another single use plastic that you're going to cut out of your life and just keep growing from there. And it will make a really big difference. Great. Well, thank you so much for that. And thank you for your time. Um, of course. To do this. Uh, for our viewers, uh, this session will be made available. Uh, we're going to um, edit it and we'll make it available uh, later this week. If not later this week, then by early next week for sure. Um, do take a look at our other offerings. Uh, we'll likely have Laurel back for another session later on. Uh, we're doing these sessions. <laughs> until the end of June. And there, um, each session is geared towards a different uh, grade level and audience. Um, and as Laurel mentioned, when this video gets posted, we'll make sure to include additional resources as well. So for the educators who are watching, these are things to try in your classroom. Um, and we'll be able to share that video that uh, Laurel, Laurel showed us in this session. Um, and if you have any additional questions or if you have feedback about the topics that you would like to see or about this particular session, or if you have additional questions for Laurel, please just contact me directly. We'll make sure that all the questions get answered. So with that, we'll wrap up a little bit early. So thank you so much, Laurel. And thank, thank you, you everybody for watching today. And have a great afternoon. Thanks. Have a good one. Hi.